What's up, guys? I know it's been a minute, but we are back. And from here on out, we promise it's going to be consecutive. Coming back with another KIO macro. Got a little bit of a lot to run to. It's been a while. A yeah, a little bit of a lot. We're going to talk about crypto. We're going to talk about the Fed. Obviously, in crypto, we've been in a bull market. Things have been green. We got my boy JT. We got Mr. Sherlock Holmes over here. Isaac, how you doing, man? Doing well, doing well. Doing well, looking well. I love it. Hell yeah. Well, shit, man. Y'all ready to jump into it? Let's do it. All right, guys. So per usual, got the central bank balance sheet just dropping and dropping, offloading those bonds. Got the M2 money supply still consolidating. Money bag Joe still printing somewhere. We got gold at an all-time high, which is kind of weird that inflation is down and gold's rising. We got the S&P at another all-time high pretty much. You got the NASDAQ at another all-time high. You got NASDAQ at an all-time high. And then you got Apple still consolidating around previous all-time high levels. It's looked like, looked like they're turning their previous all-time high into support and looking to take off a little bit more. They're Well, they're under the 200-day moving average. So only time will tell. You never really know what Apple. They have enough money to buy all of their stocks, probably. Um, so let's kind of start going into crypto. As I've been saying for months, Coinbase stock is the only stock I'm buying. It's obviously an oscillator to Bitcoin. Bitcoin has been ripping. So Coinbase has been ripping right alongside. And we got Bitcoin at previous all-time high levels. Looks like it's trying to turn it into support, which is good. And we still haven't hit the halving yet. Guys, this is the first time in history that we saw Bitcoin reach an all-time high level before the Bitcoin halving. And it's obviously due to the BlackRock ETF that we've been covering on here for the past few months, pretty much since its inception. But you also got Ethereum. So BlackRock, and we made a video on this, BlackRock filed for an Ethereum ETF uh, along with, I think, eight or nine other applicants. And uh, they filled out over 500 applications. They've only been denied once. So I think that when and if, because it's a matter of when, not if, it may not get approved at one of these deadlines, but I think it'll get approved. All the deadlines are kind of spread out from May all the way to the end of the year. But if an ETH ETF gets approved, I think it'll cause a pump for ETH, obviously, smaller market cap, institutional you know, appeal. And then I also think more importantly, more profitably, it's going to cause altcoins to pump that are on ETH, which are most of the real world asset protocols that we cover here on this channel. You have the crypto total market cap look as, looks like it's trying to turn previous all-time resistance into support. So we are in a bull market. You got stablecoin market cap dominance. This is Tether. It's in the bull market range. You know, when this is down, that means people are selling their stable coins for altcoins. Got the same thing happening with USDC. And then, you know, the altcoins that we've been talking about have been pumping. Radix is up around... Pretty much 2x from the bottom, and I think that'll keep pumping. They've been launching a lot of different things in their ecosystem. They brought on some market makers. They just got a two-way bridge launched, and they're offering a lot of grants and pumping just, just money into the system. And the foundation stopped selling Radix tokens. Wow, Pendle's up big today. We made a video on Pendle back when it was around $0.66 November. Cents in November. Now it's $6.16, guys. So if you've been watching us, you've been making money. Look at that green volume. That is lovely. I'm not going to go into all the other altcoins. You guys feel free to watch the videos on the channel that we've made. But one thing I do want to talk about before I pass it off to one of the gents here. Are we in an altcoin season? It definitely feels like it. But the good news is things are not. We have we are nowhere near the blow off top. So this is the altcoin season index. It shows how altcoins are doing against Bitcoin. And as you can see here, I am on the yearly and altcoin seasons. We are above this green line, the blow off top. So December 2021, and then you have the May highs. And then you also have the August 2020 after, you know, they printed all that money from COVID. We are at levels we were at back in May of 2023, which was nothing crazy. So we still have a ways to go. And like I said, if this ETF gets approved, I think we're definitely going to be in an altcoin season. And obviously, we got the Bitcoin halving. We got tons of narratives, all of which we talk about on this channel. I was kind of curious, actually. I want to get your guys' thoughts real quick. Where do you think Solana is going to be going this season? Where do I think Solana is going to go? So right now, it's number five. And, you know, you have the law of diminishing returns. So I think it'll pump because it's Solana. 
it's a VC chain. Uh, obviously, it won't pump as hard as last cycle. Right now, we're at a market cap of 81 billion. And then if we go to DeFi Llama and we look at the building that's happening on Solana, right now we have a TVL of 4.6 billion. The TVL has been rising, but there isn't a lot of new protocols on Solana. Most like has been force fed. Yeah, most of the activity that's been happening are Solana meme coins. People have been getting rich off Solana meme coins. So am I, I've never been a big Solana fan. I don't hold any. I've never done any farming on the Solana network. I've never yeah. done anything with it. If I look at the chart, you have previous all-time highs at 258. I wouldn't be surprised if it doubled that and went to around 300, 350 bucks. So getting to around this level here. But that's just from the little bit of data that I just looked at right now, because, you know, obviously I don't really keep up with them. But what do you think Solana is going to do this cycle? Me? Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if it made it to 300. I've seen some estimations that it's going to be a lot higher than that. Um, I hear people calling for a thousand. I'm like, bro, come on. <laughs> yeah, I'm not too sure about that. Have they solved the business hours issue where like Solana seems to have like business hours where it can like shut down unexpectedly is that is that all being kind of taken care of not been solved i still hear about it going down okay and yeah, i just heard about it week. like what three weeks or a month ago last time i heard that yeah fairly recent yeah i think that it's um a lot of people who like solana love solana like, it's almost like a cult classic for certain oh, definitely. definitely you know but i i would agree i think that this is the era of uh institutional adoption and i'm just not sure if solana is quite able to make that like institutional next step. Yeah, and since BlackRock are, is putting their tokenized fund on Ethereum, that mm -hmm. could shift a lot of institutions thinking as well. Because, you know, you see like talking heads when it comes to Solana. Um, and like I said, I feel like it's been more force fed. It is not really like organic growth. So I guess I don't really have a strong opinion on it either. It's like, I could see it shooting up just because of the talking pundits on it. But in terms of fundamental value, I'm not seeing any. Also, a lot of people have been complaining on Twitter today, actually, this guy, Jay Call, who I follow for like a lot of yield farming stuff. Mm -hmm. he's, he made a tweet today and said, what's the point of Solana Network if the transactions never go through? I get they're cheap, but I'd rather pay one cent on the Polygon Network and have my transaction completed versus within a minute versus uh, paying cheaper on Solana and have it not go through at all. So people talk about like making certain trades and them not being able to realize their profits because of the network. And that makes sense because the barriers to entry to be a Solana validator is fucking insane, bro. Oh my yeah. God. You can spend millions of dollars and you still risk not being profitable. So. Yeah, that's fair. That's good assessment. Yep. So Isaac, do you have any other thoughts on crypto? Yeah, I mean, thoughts on crypto. So it is looking like the having date is uh, tentatively April 20th. I believe that is what uh, the calculation kind of puts April out. April 20th. So this month. 16 days. 16 days. Yep. The so we're on really. We're, April, that's going to be crazy. It's going to be crazy. And usually you're right. We don't usually get all time. Means the price will be high. No, it means the <laughs> price. Well, likely. And April is the, I believe it's the highest performing month for stocks either april or december that's good yeah so that's good so this month is a pretty good month to be in the market historically speaking and based on the having and yeah my my presumption would be as we get closer to election uh you know election date which is when you know historically you see uh, presidential elections stocks kind of go up into the election day if that also correlates pretty heavily with the cycle that we see for halvings. So post having in the next few months, we're going to see the price of Bitcoin continue to go up. That's going to track pretty well with the uh, how things typically go into an election year. So I am pretty, uh, I guess, uh, uh, happy to see the confluence of different forces that should be, you know, pushing the price up. I'm in accord with that. You concur? I concur. I can oh, that's good. Okay. Sounds like I'm the happy. stars are aligning that now. The last star and the most important star is the North Star. That fit. What's going so, on? So, real quick, man. I actually um I made a video on this on my page. Sorry guys, I'm really tired today, but uh, I made a video on on that on my page about the Goldilocks regime in which everything is doing well. 
And so stock market shooting high, bonds are holding relatively steady at the moment. The labor market is doing well. The consumer is strong. Housing is doing well. Bitcoin and crypto in general is doing pretty well. Gold's doing well. So on the surface, everything is looking good, right? And there's a way to sustain it, but the Federal Reserve faces two risks at the moment. So one risk is cutting rates too soon. The second is cutting rates too late. Now, the risk with cutting rates too soon is that you reignite inflation and then you end up in the same position and then you probably have to raise rates again. So you have to backtrack on what you're doing, right? And so they don't really want that. But on the flip side, the second risk, and I think they will, this is the bigger risk, you risk keeping rates restricted for too long or keeping them at this level for too long. The real Fed funds rate is over 2% currently. And so oh, anything over zero is technically restricted, but one and a half percent is restrictive, restrictive, and we're over 2%. And so if they were to keep rates to where they are right now, uh, they run the risk of downside in the labor market, shooting that unemployment up to levels in which we could get a recession. We brought this up almost a year ago that we did it. Damn, has it almost been a year? that we never uh, had a recession under 5.4%. But, you know, the unemployment rate has been steadily ticking up at least like 0.1% pretty much every month. And so that's the risk on the flip side. I do think that they would prefer to have the first risk and in reignite inflation over recessionary activity in terms of the labor market. And so I do think they're going to cut rates in July. And also they don't want to be too politicized so they want to avoid cutting in september that's right before the election july gives you a little buffer june will be too early now you're getting some people arguing that they're not going to cut rates at all a lot of people calling for june too a lot of people calling for june people I'm, I'm gonna be honest people call for every month literally yeah. every month they've been calling for every month as you can see here, there's a 64% chance that we cut rates. Right, this is a, this is what the market thinks, by the way, not an actual probability. This is just what the market thinks. And so uh, there's a 64% chance that we're going to cut rates by 25 basis points in June, according to the market. This is what everyone's expecting. In July, that drops down to 49%. So the disparity is not that great, but it drops down the further you get out on in the year. I do think J June would be too early. I don't think we're going to have enough data. Uh, and the Federal Reserve, he's been doing his little tour. Uh, Jay Powell's been doing his little tour in terms of him speaking. The Federal Reserve has concerts? Like, no, I'm just saying. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, he has reiterated at every stop of the way that we're still waiting on more evidence to be confident that inflation is sustainably moving down to 2%. And if you look at the last PCE report, I mean, it's been kind of fluctuating. This last report, the one before that, uh, was revised upward. And so we effectively, there is no change. And so we're still seeing sticky inflation on the Fed's preferred inflation gauge, which is that PCE. And so there isn't enough evidence that we're sustainably moving down to that 2% level. Consumer spending has been on the rise. And even though uh, the unemployment rate has been going up, we've still been adding uh, jobs consistently every single month as well. And so that labor market is doing pretty well. Inflation is sticky, whether it's to the downside. Some people think it's sticky to the downside and some people think it's sticky to the upside. Only time will tell with that. But June, we're not going to have enough data. By July, I think it'd be appropriate. If we waited to September, it'd be too late. Then you seem like you're trying to help someone win the election. Because by lowering rates, yeah, we expect initial decline in values in terms of assets, but then things shoot back up because that's the whole point of an easing cycle. And so to maintain the Goldilocks regime, they have to find a way to literally ease their foot off the pedal, kind of like slowing down without trying to jerk. They have to find a way to ease their foot off the pedal. And on the flip side, once again, even though they don't want to seem politicized, Look, monetary policy and fiscal policy, they have to work together in order to maintain any type of macroeconomic environment. And in this case, the goal is to maintain the Goldilocks regime. No one wants a recession at the end of the day. So in order to do that, speak for yourself, in order to do that, fiscal spending, <laughs> the government, <laughs> they're, they're going to have to spend more money on infrastructure and expenditures, basically to kind of keep that buffer there and keep the consumer strong. Stimulus, different story. So we can't have stimulus spending in terms of fiscal policy, but 
they have to spend on the infrastructure side. And so they're going to have to work in tandem to basically maintain this Goldilocks regime and turn it into that official soft landing that I've been vehemently against over the past year. But there is no data telling me that there is a recession coming. Naturally, because of business cycles, yes, I would think one would be on the horizon, but that's the only reason. There is no real reason that I can point to that, oh, this means we're going into a recession. The SOM rule is looking good. And if we're abiding by the business cycle, it seems to be in the expansionary phase, which means we're still like the first innings. So in terms of a recession, I don't think it's going to happen. And to your earlier statement, Isaac, in that April should be a good month to be in the market, I agree. And I agree over the next few months as well that it's going to be a great time to be in the markets. I have a question. Let's say the Fed drops rates, starts to lower rates in July, right? Obviously, we've talked about throughout history, whenever they lower rates, that's when we see the bottom shortly thereafter. But normally, historically, when they lower rates after having them high for so long is because they know something is broken. And, you know, we're calling for a soft landing because nothing's broken. Inflation is starting to cool down, even though we don't have all the data. So it seems like they're going to be lowering rates just to lower rates because they've been high for so long. Inflation's cooling down. Nothing's broken. So now the question is, do we expect things to bottom out? Because normally I, this is this is my own thinking. Smart money, when they lower rates, they're like, oh, something's broken. Let's take a risk off approach. But if they're lowering rates, not because something's broken. The smart money still, they probably still take a risk off approach, maybe not as much because they think other people are going to do it and they don't want to lose the capital that they're managing. So my question to you guys is, do you still think we're going to drop? If so, how much and how much in the stock market and how much in the crypto markets? 35.4% in crypto. No, I, well, my, my kind of thoughts are obviously if nothing is broken, I would assume that any sort of drop in the stock market or in crypto would be you know less than what we've seen historically because obviously historically we lower rates because something breaks if nothing overtly breaks i would still expect there to be some sort of drop just because i think that we're working with limited information and people will just assume that maybe the fed knows something we don't and we could see a bit of a drop but if nothing's broken i mean i i don't really foresee it being as much as uh, it's been in the past obviously stocks would drop Crypto would be dropping at a higher rate just because it has a higher alpha. The only thing that's concerning is commercial real estate market. Like that's the only thing conceivably I could see leading to like a uh, break or like something that actually concerns the Fed. But um, I don't know. In lieu of that taking a major nosedive, yeah, I would assume that things would be dropping and probably go back to normal. Uh, but it's very unprecedented. Hard to tell. Do you have a time yeah. frame on when you think it'll go back to normal if that's if that were the scenario? Um, April 31st, and I think it'll be back by no, I don't know. Uh, I, I was gonna say, man, that's a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's very, I mean, in my mind, it's uh because it's very unprecedented. I I would say that the if nothing's breaking and rates are being cut, my presumption would be you want to be in the market. Maybe don't be in the market for immediately when rates cut, but I would probably not want to stay out of the market for too long. If there's nothing fundamentally wrong with the with the market, I would probably not want to stay out of it for too long if you do plan on being out. Uh, because my presumption is people would, would figure out that, that things are basically fine. Um, and rate cuts generally would then just boost economic activity given like the medium to long term. So yeah, so I think in this case. And we talked about this before extrapolation is probably more difficult than ever just because at this point in time the reason they will cut is to avoid breakage not because something broke and so the two things that are most pressing that could break is cre you talked about commercial real estate and the labor market once again with cre super obviously interest rate sensitive sector and so by lowering rates you kind of relieve some of that pressure and they can extend and pretend that's a phrase in the cre space you extend and pretend you're healthy basically and so they effectively are zombie companies and so that would be one uh one reason they lower rates just to help cre but we'll see you know we don't really know that until it happens because a lot of these books we don't see yet in terms of cre companies because there's a lot of private ownership as well that has loans to regional banks 
And so we're not going to see those <laughs> until it happens. The other reason is what I what I mentioned before in that okay inflation got back down to their target range of two percent and there was no breakage in the labor market that warrants a rate cut or at least if we're close to that number and we've got no downside risk in the labor market then that would warrant a rate cut because if we stayed here at a real rate of over two percent that would be considered very restrictive if we stayed here like i said that would just cause more downside to the unemployment rate or i guess upside to the unemployment rate and so we've been going up what 0.1 percent every single month just by staying here that's going to get exacerbated if we kept moving further leaving rates where they are obviously i could be wrong here but i actually i don't think we would see a drop i mean it's it's pretty much priced in like in both markets yeah it's pretty much priced in it's like it's kind of what markets expect and at this point, because of Jay Powell's forward guidance has been kind of on point, if he, let's say if he did lower rates in June, I think people would be a little worried that inflation is going to reignite and that could cause a drop. If he did do it in July, after we got a little more data giving us that confidence, then markets would just continue to kind of soar. Um, and maybe not soar, but they'll continue to the upside. How many basis points you think they'll drop it when they start lowering rates? 25. 25 basis points. Precipitously. They'll, they'll drop it precipitously. <laughs> yeah, they, you know, I mean, we did raise them by 75 basis points per when we were going up. Yeah. When we were uh, hiking rates. But this time, it wouldn't make sense to just start lowering rates back to the zero bound, making money extremely cheap again. Then we'll end up in the same position five years from now. And so... That wouldn't make sense. And so it's literally just finding a delicate balance between uh, what that neutral rate is and the balance between these various sectors. Single family housing, for example, I've been talking about this for a long time. I think we bottomed out in terms of rents and uh, values. So it's only up from here. CRE could be the same thing. If I don't know what rates would be extremely appropriate for them to extend and pretend, because a lot of them were at the zero bound. So I'm not sure if they would be able to survive at 2%, but we shall see. And the labor market, man, is just looking good. So I don't think, I don't think we'll see a precipitous decline at all, to be honest, once we start at that easing cycle. I think that would be good news to the markets. And that means because, like I said, his forward guidance, he's been kind of saying the same thing for a year and a half straight. So that means like, oh, he's right. Okay, we're good to go. And I think people kind of take it that way. And because of that, you know, I do think yields, and I've been saying this for a while too, that they will remain elevated in treasuries. And so we're probably going to get some downside in buying values or just consolidation, but they stay in that same range in terms of yields relative to values. Yeah. What if like, man, it'd be crazy if like the market soars after lowering rates because smart money's like, well, nothing's broken. They're just lowering it. Shit, let's borrow some money and buy some assets. That'd be great, but I'm not expecting that, obviously. Yeah, I just can't see anything. Like, I, I don't know what's breaking at the moment. The, uh, the biggest risk is probably CRE. Other than that, you got a balance between inflation and jobs. Well, I guess, uh, have you guys made any changes to your portfolio? I'm just getting more diversified into RWA protocols and, you know, still yield farming. The volume and the yields have been picking up precipitously. What about you guys? Same. Just going long because I, I don't I'm not going to invest like there's a recession coming up. I can't do that. Then you miss things. And it's like I would almost rather take some of that downside risk, but be in the market. If there was a slight pullback, I'll just buy more. Yeah, I'm pretty heavily invested in uh, various cryptocurrencies. Uh, <laughs> notably. <laughs> <laughs> As you should be, my good brother. <laughs> yeah, I like cryptocurrency, so I bought a lot of it. Bitcoin, obviously, because I, you know, I'm I'm safe. Uh, quite a bit of Solana, actually, mostly because it hasn't hit its all time high yet. My presumption is is that it is going to surpass it by quite a lot once things start to cycle into uh, Solana. So um, yeah, I bought quite a bit of Solana, and uh, those are the main ones that I'm I'm experimenting with a few low market cap ones anyone you you down to talk about no 
So I can give a <laughs> bullish thesis on RWAs real quick. And I kind of mentioned this before. So RWAs, by the way, guys, is real world assets. So a lot of them deal with private money effectively, right? So anytime you're dealing with private money, it's also, it's an interest rate sensitive sector. And we've had, relatively speaking, elevated interest rates for a, a good while now. Almost two years, right? Yeah, and RWAs have been doing pretty, pretty okay. You know, we saw the recent pump due to some fundamental reasons, of course, uh, but they've been, they've been doing pretty well in a high interest rate environment. Now, we're going into an easing cycle. An easing cycle for RWA protocols is fantastic. Obviously, you got real estate in that. You got whatever re real world asset it is, it's usually affected heavily by interest rates. And so by going into an easing cycle, I can only see, this is on top of BlackRock putting their tokenized fund on Ethereum. I can only see RWA protocols and Ethereum doing extremely well, especially when we start cutting rates. So Ethereum is probably going to end up being uh, the heaviest weight in my bag over time. And uh, yeah, I'm going to have a focus on RWAs in this cycle because I'm we're looking for some big ass gains. Big ones. Big ones. Big ones. Big and it's news. only getting it's only getting validated by the likes of I keep saying BlackRock. It's not like they're not important. They're basically the government fucking fund. So I mean, it's pretty validating. And they just seeded a hundred million. I mean, man, I, I only see RWAs and Ethereum moving to the upside. Meme coins, I'm not gonna speak on that bullshit. You know, if if people if you want to buy mean coins, folks, that's up to you. That ain't me. This guy was just saying the other week. I was I, telling. I was, I, was, I, was, nope. I was saying I was thinking, no, no. thinking about it. Like maybe I'll fuck around. No, 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 nope. This guy. I said I'm gonna go meme hunting. Wait, bro. I told him. Uh, I think it was a meme coin on Rad. I think it was Hook. And I was like, yeah, you could have turned like, what was it? $33 <laughs> into three grand? No, 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 no. It was 6,000. Yeah. Bro, think about the percentage gain. I, I don't know. What is that? 18,000%? Something like that. Bro, he was sitting there like this for like five minutes. And he was like, bro, I'm going meme hunting, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, can you blame the guy? Bro, yeah. that could that could make it very enticing. But you know, once I snap back to reality, I'm like, ah, I'm good. It's like, bro, I didn't at hear this about point, it after that. So that's true. It, it at this point, it's like, bro, now is the best time for you to spot some real fundamental value projects that are genuinely undervalued, and it's all on chain. So I mean, it's right there. It's right there. You can see market cap versus TVL or type of activity they have on the chain. And you can pretty much determine relatively quick. And it's, I feel like now is one of the easier times to see what's undervalued without all the fluff and speculation. And now you can also get a bunch of gains because a lot of these projects are small that are undervalued. And so your potential for gains is pretty high. And so for me, it's like, it just doesn't make sense to, to kind of risk it all on meme coins, unless, you know, it's probably a hundred dollars and I'm like, I'll just throw oh, it in there. In your portfolio. You know, and look, if it goes up 18,000% and I make, Fucking seven thousand bucks, ten thousand or something on that. Hey, I'm not gonna be mad. Yeah, good time to be in the markets, guys. In our opinion, obviously, none of this is financial advice. We gotta say that too. But we're gonna keep bringing you guys the high quality research. Go through the videos on our channel. We cover all the RWA protocols, and I put the uh, take profit and yield farming strategy on my personal channel, Crypto Noah. But guys, it's gonna be a wild ride. You gotta strap up your seat belts. And let's make some money and go follow Jay Manchin. We follow the money, we follow the Fed, and we let it trickle down. And we're never on the wrong side of history. And lastly, I'm with her. Subscribe to our email list. We're gonna be bringing you alpha there too. But yeah, other than that, guys, we thank y'all for tuning in. Like, comment, subscribe, share with a friend, and we'll see y'all next week. You might want to write this down. Fuck off. <laughs> oh my gosh that's horrible <laughs> sorry fuckers that's really just inappropriate <laughs> <laughs>